of the Arthur Carter Institute. And on behalf of the faculty, I want to thank you for coming and welcome you to uh, the Arthur Carter Institute. Um, we had a naming ceremony here about two weeks ago to dedicate this wonderful space. And one of the things we did was resolve to hold more public forums and seminars to bring issues before the public of concern uh, to everyone about the future of journalism. And along those lines, we're honored tonight to host the National Press Club Centennial Forum in New York City and a very distinguished panel of journalists who are here to discuss the First Amendment and the future of journalism. Our moderator for the evening is Gil Klein. Gil served for 25 years as national correspondent for Media General News Service. He covered the White House, Congress, the Supreme Court, and national uh, political campaigns. Now Gill is director of the National Press Club Centennial Project, which commemorates the 100th anniversary of the National Press Club. As you know, the Press Club has excelled uh, for many, many years at providing a forum for national and international leaders to interact with the press about important issues. And we're delighted to be the host now as the Press Club goes on the road. Gil, welcome. Thank you very much, Stephen. I certainly appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for coming. What a great turnout. Uh, the, uh, as uh, Stephen was telling you, for a century, the National Press Club has been the gathering point in Washington for journalists and newsmakers. All of the uh, heroes and villains and the rogues and the wannabes have all come through our doors uh, to try and get their message across to reporters. Uh, the club is uh, well known for providing all kinds of forums for, uh, uh, for news and for professional development. But now for our centennial, they have uh, uh, said that it's time to take the show on the road. Uh, they are sending me across the country in these tumultuous times for journalists uh, and for journalism to talk about where is this business going and uh, how are we going to maintain its core values? At each stop, I, I gather leading journalists and I ask them the same thing. What is the future of journalism? Tell me they want me to go back to the club and tell them where we're going. And every, usually every time they look at me and say, well, Gil, that's, that's what we were hoping you would tell us. So that is what we're here today to do. I want to thank our co-sponsors uh, for this forum, the Foreign Press Association, uh, and especially its president, Noel uh, Latif, and New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, uh, Brooke uh, Kroger and uh, uh, Kate Panuski have done an amazing things uh, to make this a reality, and thank you all very much for doing that. I'd also like to thank Aviva USA, our corporate sponsor. Uh, Aviva is one of the uh, fastest growing insurance companies in the United States, and Aviva agrees with the National Press Club that a free press is essential for a free society and free enterprise. Uh, now, I, I invite all of you to join, uh, who are eligible to join the National Press Club. There are some of these around, or you can go to our website. It's got a, a great deal for out-of-town uh, people who uh, are interested in the news. And we also have produced for our centennial a uh, a documentary called The National Press Club, A Century of Headlines. Free ones were on your, uh, each of the chairs and there's a pile of them back there. Uh, and I, there's plenty more in the box. Take them home uh, and enjoy it. Uh, but before we start our panel, uh, I would like to uh, show you a short 10-minute uh, version of, of the video that uh, so you give you an idea of what the National Press Club is all about. And uh, somebody was supposed to be going back and pushing a button right about now to make it happen. It's happening. It's happening. It's, happening. it's happening soon. Ah, there we go. Professional Journalism's American epicenter is the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. 
located in the heart of our nation's capital and is a home away from home and the office for print and broadcast journalists throughout the United States and from across the world. I'm a proud member of the National Press Club and I have a lifetime of golden memories from my association with this fine institution and my colleagues in my chosen profession, journalism. The National Press Club celebrates its centennial in 2008 and to commemorate that landmark event, the club's Board of Governors has commissioned the production of an hour-long documentary and accompanying journalism educational materials. Its purpose is to capture for perpetuity the impact that the club, its members, its events and services have had on Americans, America, and our world. At a time when news gathering and delivery platforms are diversifying at an unprecedented pace, luminaries from the print and broadcast media share their career experiences and perspectives on the National Press Club and the future of journalism in the 21st century. I regard the National Press Club as a national treasure and a place of historic significance for our country. I know that the successes of its first 100 years have established a rock-solid foundation for the club's next century of commitment to excellence in journalism. So enjoy this preview of the NPC 100 documentary, and please join me in supporting the National Press Club's mission. If one wanted to find a place in Washington, D.C., the capital of a great country, where journalism comes together, of all the people who make power, who represent power, if you need one place, you need the National Press Club. It's very appropriate that the National Press Club is located. There really hadn't been many Washington reporters here before the Civil War. But when the Civil War started in 1861, everybody wanted to cover the war. The National Press Club was founded in 1908. And I'd like to tell you that it was founded for some lofty journalistic reason, like defense of the First Amendment. But the fact of the matter is, the club was founded because in 1908, the bars in Washington closed at midnight. As soon as the National Press Club got established, presidents started showing up. Uh, William Howard Taft, who was not fond of the press corps, didn't really like reporters, uh, dutifully came over to the National Press Club when it was established. But the man who really uh, was uh, ideal for the press and who really fit the National Press Club was Warren G. Hardy. He saw himself as a member of the club, and he was an honorary member of the club as presidents have been since then. Well, I was a uh, distant observer when Harry Truman was playing the piano there at the press club and Warren McCall was seated up there on the top with uh, the right amount of leg. It was rather shocking to the public at that time because that was considered to be uh, quite an indecent amount of leg. But as you look at it today, it doesn't seem so indecent. And he invited Warren McCall to come and join him. He didn't invite her to jump up on the top of the piano. That was her own invention, but it turned out to be one of the most stunning photographs that uh, was ever recorded at the National Press Club. Well, the uh, National Press Club, like other institutions uh, over the years, uh, was segregated uh, by gender and by race, as were the American media and other major American institutions. But what's interesting to me is that uh, the press club, uh, like the Gridiron Club and other institutions uh, in Washington, their press related and all, um, let blacks in before let women in. Which <laughs> is says something about different levels of bias in our society and, uh, and, uh, and not just our society. Everyone wanted to attend the luncheon with Khrushchev because it was a new phenomenon that there was even the possibility that the United States could suddenly develop. Uh, less hostility in the Cold War with Soviet Union. That seemed to be a real breakthrough, and everybody in Washington, whether you were in the press or you were a lobbyist or a lawmaker or anything, wanted to be at that luncheon. So we all knew that it was a very dramatic time and, and a very important speech that Khrushchev would be delivering. 
but that he was not as conciliatory as we can bargain for. And he did say, we will bury you, which was a memorable line out of that uh, uh, address. And it haunted us, in a way, because we then knew that he had thrown down the gauntlet and that there was a real contest between the two forms of government. Presidents began to use the National Press Club as uh, their exit from Washington. And LBJ uh, decided that that's where he would go uh, to make his last speech in Washington, or his almost last speech. And so by this time, humor uh, became essential. I mean, presidents began to recognize more and more that laughter was what uh, the press would remember. And on another occasion, I remember, well, I guess you were more actors, I did show my scar. But I think an explanation you ought to know that it was only after a question from Sarah McClendon. <laughs> and she said, Mr. President, you've been in office almost two years, and what do you have to show for it? <laughs> January the 2nd, 1980, we covered our first National Press Club luncheon with Paul Volcker. And we haven't missed any since then. There have been several thousand luncheons and speakers. And we've dedicated ourselves to covering them all. Covering the National Press Club luncheon speeches has always been one of my favorite things because there are rare opportunities in society on a national basis for an individual to get up and give a full speech on their terms, not on anybody else's terms. And it's one of the great things that people do, have to get up and motivate and inform. At breakfast time, lunch time, all through the day, there are events going on there that appeal to a whole range of interests. And I think that in 50% of the stories that announce an anonymous source in the first paragraph, that that person will be identified sometime later in the story. You have to supply the outrage. We'll supply the facts. That's the nature of journalism in a democratic society. When you go interview somebody, they take things so seriously. So if you come in and say, you know, Hubs, that uh, article you wrote for Foreign Affairs in 1982, on page 97, you said the following, and I was just wondering exactly what you meant. Right, now do you think he's gonna remember what he wrote? Oh yes, he will. Because <laughs> he takes himself seriously. On behalf of the Newspapers Committee today, I'd like to introduce today's newspaper. He is actor, director, and Academy Award winner, George Clooney. Mr. Clooney comes to us today, straight off a trip this week from the Sudan. We'd like to turn uh, now to hear his personal response to what you witnessed on the ground in Darfur. Please help me welcome George Clooney. Five days ago, my father and I were on the border of Chad and Darfur. We were watching the refugees spilling into the camps uh, some two years after President Bush and Colin Powell officially declared these uh, atrocities genocide. A chill is descending on Washington and has nothing to do with this endless winter. It's the chill on news gathering that has begun to affect the everyday work of journalists covering the nation's capital. The summer of headline writing, subpoenas, and threats of jail and fines against journalists is taking a toll on reporting even as journalists repeatedly refuse to reveal the names of their confidential sources. Even though I know I don't want to go to jail, and I know Matt doesn't as the father of a young child, I think that there is a principle that's so important here at stake that we have to be willing to do that. We got Robert Novak Cruz to tell. He knew Calvin Coolidge very well. Novak leaked his secret tale, and Judith Miller went to jail. News leaks are as American as cherry pie. They are a part of the process. In a totalitarian society, there is only one source of news. In a democracy, you have a second source, and that is the version that is produced by a free press. A citizen can then check the government version against the version he gets 
uh, from the press and decide which one that he or she wants to believe. If there were no other reason for having a free press, that alone would be reason enough. My wishes to the press club are a hundred more years uh, of activity uh, so that we can be assured that the press in Washington will always be as alert as it is today, uh, as dedicated as it is today, uh, as uh, fundamental as we all know it to be to the workings of our democracy. All right, if we can gather our panel up here. Here we go. Uh, we've got uh, Jay, you're the second from the end. There's a, uh, come on up. <laughs> oh, Joe? Uh, you're the second uh, one in. And uh, Dan, you're at the end. Thank and you. Tom, you're right here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you know, take your seats there. And uh, a, a topic that comes up wherever journalists. I'm sorry. Yes, they stop coming. Uh, yes, OK, a topic that comes up wherever journalists gather these, day, where, these days, whether it's the National Press Club bar or the Senate Press Gallery or uh, the White House Press Room or right here and anywhere in New York City where reporters gather, is where is this business going? And uh, how are we going to protect it? Every day you see headlines, uh, whether it's the uh, Washington Post cu cutting 100 reporters, or the Palm Beach Post uh, slashing its uh, reporting staff in half, or uh, whether the, the New House News Bureau is being just completely eliminated after decades of doing great Washington reporting. Reporters want to know what, what is happening. Will the press still be the watchdog of government? Is there a threat to the First Amendment and freedom of the press? But there is also, this is also a great time of, of innovation. Uh, reporters uh, are now finding they can write their stories uh, in the newspaper and it's, uh, it shows up all around the world. Thousands and thousands of people or millions of people can uh, see it instantaneously. There are all kinds of new, way, new ways to get your uh, story out, whether reporters are carrying uh, web cameras or uh, they're blogging or they're twittering. I've never seen reporters so excited as when they were talking about all their twittering that's going on now. Uh, so uh, this could be, as one panelist said uh, on this tour, if we could just find a way, uh, this could be a golden age for journalism, if we could just find a way to pay for it. Uh, it was Tom Rosenstiel at one of our, our panels who said uh, that, report, that journalism students are the lucky ones. He said, when we went to journalism school, all we were taught was, if you do what your elders did, you'll be fine. But for the, this generation of journalism students, you're going to have a chance to reinvent journalism, and that is a really exciting thing to do. But the question is, will you have the, the steeped in the ethics and the uh, mission of journalism so that you know how to take advantage of this new technology to, and how can you tell great stories? Uh, so where is journalism heading? Uh, we have this extraordinarily distinguished panel uh, who can talk not just about what is happening in New York City, but across the nation and around the world. Start with Tom Curley, is president of the Associated Press, which is the largest news gathering organization in the world. Before that, he was editor of USA Today. A few years ago, uh, when multimedia journalism was just uh, beginning, he gave me a tour of USA Today to explain how he was in implementing that, that convergence. Uh, Jill Abramson is uh, the managing editor of the New York Times, a uh, veteran of the time. She was uh, Washington bureau chief during the run-up to the Iraq war before her promotion to managing editor. <clears throat> Dan Rather, at the end, has one of the most recognizable names and faces in journalism with more than four decades in television news. He was the anchor of CBS Evening News before leaving in a dispute over a story on President Bush's military record. He is now doing the type of long-form television journalism he says he always wanted to do, 
as the global correspondent and managing editor of Dan Rather Reports on HDNet. Jay Rosen is a press critic and writer whose primary focus is the media's role in democracy. A member of the faculty here at NYU since 1986, he teaches courses in media criticism. He is a champion of citizen journalism and the role of bloggers in the news media. Now I'm going to throw out some questions to our panelists, but I encourage you all to jump in and make this a lively discussion, if not a free-for-all. And at the end, uh, after we've done this for a while, we'll encourage you to come up uh, and ask your own questions here. There's a microphone set up here, so when the time comes, you can all line up there and it'll be your great chance to, to get a shot at these people. Uh, now, as, uh, as I go around the nation holding these forums, I see and hear that th in these times of revenue losses, newspapers are cutting Washington reporters and state capital reporters. They're uh, dropping auxiliary wire services. Why? Well, because the Associated Press will do it all. And uh, the AP is also the main source of news in, uh, uh, when you log into Yahoo, which is where many people get most of their news. That's quite a responsibility. Uh, Tom, can, you, uh, can the AP really be all things to all people, and should it? <laughs> really appreciate the chance to go first tonight, Gil, on, on these types of questions. But let me begin uh, by thanking the audience. I think uh, it's really encouraging to those of us on the panel to look out and see this much interest in the press. Uh, it's the best news that I can imagine that any of us have had in months. So thank you for being here and, uh, and thank you for caring about what really is important. Uh, the short answer is AP can't be all things to all people. And if you go back through the history of reporting at the State House or reporting in Washington, the original reporters who went from their papers uh, were there to give accountability on their representatives who were in Washington or at State Houses. And AP's coverage of these institutions, whether state or uh, federal, is more at a higher level. So I think a gap is being created. <clears throat> we have been looking at what that means. And in as recently as July, we were speaking with some newspapers about finding a way to collectively uh, pull some resources and, and plug the gap. So while one newspaper or a series of newspapers could no longer afford someone to provide that detailed accountability. Perhaps together we might add somebody. But you know what's happened in the last hundred days and a dire situation has turned now into one of absolutely fighting for survival. So those concepts seem off the table. I think all you have to do t is to look at what's happened to the states. They're not getting the coverage at the state houses uh, that, that is required to make them function properly in a democracy. There are some absolute shambles of state government as we look at the situations from around the country. So it's, it is quite serious. I do believe that the one area that we are really being resolute about is international. Um, and we've had some criticism from domestic editors who think we ought to stop covering international because they've had to close some of their foreign bureaus. Um, we believe that the responsibility on us is greater than ever, and we have been working very, very hard to make sure that um, we are doing the best possible job and that we have the best possible people in place. So we have redoubled our efforts there. Well, Jill, that gets me into what I wanted to ask you, which is when I go around uh, the country, I hear people say, well, we have the, uh, we don't need to cover, we don't need to put foreign news in our newspaper. Uh, we'll just do local, local, local. We've got people can go on the web and read the New York Times. But of course, uh, foreign news correspondents. happy to have. Them. Yes, <laughs> uh, but for, foreign news uh, is very expensive to do. Uh, and uh, can you keep up? Uh, uh, and is this also a, a good thing for journalism? Uh, we haven't retreated uh, one bit from foreign coverage. We've had to, as you know, different parts of the world heat up, we've had to redeploy some people from one place to another, but our commitment to cover the world is as big and serious as it's ever 
uh, been. The problem right now is, you know, between the election and the financial crisis, trying to like protect uh, space, especially on the front page these days for great foreign stories, has become a little tougher. But the pipeline is full of them. Uh, I was just, uh, before I came here, doing a kind of hideous Sophie's Choice between, you know, gripping story about the Congo and one about the, you know, horrible situation in China with, you know, milk for, you know, poison milk for babies. And, you know, these very rich stories done by, you know, New York Times correspondents who, uh, you know, devote themselves uh, fully to covering their countries and areas and regions, uh, both for the newspaper. And we also own the International Herald Tribune. And obviously, we've got uh, the largest newspaper website, uh, which now you know amplifies uh, our stories and extends our reach uh, in really profound ways. And you know, we. The business environment is very challenging, and you know Tom is, is absolutely right to say, you know, on top of what was already a very challenging environment, we now have uh, what's going on in the economy, which will, you know, uh, make the impact even worse. But you know, I I feel, you know, very blessed that at the times, you know, we've had to retreat from some beats and some areas of coverage, but nothing where I feel we, have, we are disappointing our readers with our commitment to cover our country, you know, to give a, a full national report, a full international report. And Metro is, to be honest, the area where we've had to make some choices and sacrifices. And there, uh, what we decided to do, you've noticed, is, you know, add, have the Metro report be part of the A section. So you get international, national, and then uh, city news. And we've gone back to the core of New York City city and cut back uh, some on our regional coverage in New Jersey and Connecticut and Long Island. That was a painful choice for us, but uh, one that didn't involve sacrifices in other key areas. And we still, every week, give you a wonderful science section, uh, which doesn't bring in a whole lot of advertising revenue, but is part of our commitment to serving what we call our knowledge audience, which is a high quality, highly educated right. audience, which is voracious for uh, everything from science to the latest on fashion, which we gave you today in Thursday Styles. <laughs> Good. Uh, Dan, uh, Katie Couric said at the press club last year that no matter how good she could be, her audience will shrink because the demographic who watch uh, the evening news is, to put it charitably, uh, reaching their expiration date. Uh, do you see an inevitable decline in network television news, and uh, how, how would the networks uh, deal with that, do you think? Well, first of all, I, I do see a decline. I'm not sure it's inevitable, but there's a, a clear trend line down. Network news. I think the question for the moment is uh, the whether the commitment of the ownership of the large networks, who are part of, without exception, I think, large international conglomerates, a lot depends on their commitment as to how far it declines and how quickly it declines. <coughs> as a personal opinion, I would not be surprised. I'm not predicting what happen. I would not be surprised to see one or more of the major over the airways networks um, do away with the evening news as we have known it. Having said that, I believe that uh, someone, at least someone, will stay in that core business. And if they redouble their commitment to quality <coughs> journalism and integrity, I think it will be a good business. I'm not saying it will have the largest circulation, you know, the best demographics, but I think it will be a good business, good business, the definition being in this context, uh, make money and deliver stockholder value. In the same way that the New York Times doesn't have the largest circulation in the country, they have a very healthy circulation, they have the largest circulation. As Jill has pointed out, they have the, what, 
think she called the knowledge readers, um, which is attractive to advertisers. So uh, I don't think it's all gloom and doom uh, for a network television, but I get back to um, so much depends on whether at the very top, particularly the ownership, whether the ownership goes back to at least some semblance of seeing news as a public trust and has some commitment to making sure that news is practiced in the public interest, which isn't to say that it shouldn't make money. And um, by the way, the current evening news broadcasts, you can say what you want to about them, they make a lot of money. They don't make as much money as perhaps um, those who do the accounting would like. It doesn't increase uh, by a certain amount every quarter, but these are money-making machines. But you know, when you talk about the future, whether it be evening newscasts, uh, magazines, newspapers, radio, what have you, uh, that I think uh, what's lacking are two things at the moment. Um, one is optimism. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature and experience. And to say that I've been practicing journalism professionally for almost 60 years, uh, I'm not, I don't profess to be an expert, but I didn't just uh, waddle off the water wagon either. And that uh, it can make money, it has made money, it does make money, it can be a, a good commercial enterprise. But one, we have to stay optimistic about it, not naively optimistic, but so often we concentrate on what we are doing tonight, and I think uh, to good cause. Um, but all of these uh, pronouncements of uh, near death, I think, are premature. And the second thing is idealism. That one reason I'm here tonight without being preachy about it, uh, when we talk about the future of journalism, much depends on some of the people in this room. Whether they succumb uh, to negativism, cynicism, or whether uh, they reach for the highest idealism possible. Uh, in those two things, uh, I think, lies the future and all of our futures as to whether uh, we stop the bleeding of such things that you mentioned of, or somebody mentioned earlier of entertainment values completely overwhelming news values, tsunami-like, or whether we uh, retrench and begin to slog our way back, slug our way back to at least some symbolism of seeing um, journalism uh, as a public trust and try to commit ourselves passionately to the responsibilities of that trust. Okay, uh, now Jay, uh, you have famously called bloggers and citizen journalists the people, um, the people formerly known as the audience. As I go across the country, this is a big, a big point. I hear talk of pro-am journalism. I hear journalists rail against the uh, loose standards of citizen journalists who are showing up on mainstream media websites. And most recently, there was the case of a, a blogger who posted an eye report on CNN.com that Apple CEO Steve Jobs had suffered a heart attack, even though it was totally false and had the weight of CNN behind it. Uh, where do you see this all going? First of all, uh, thanks to the National Press Club for bringing your show here to our new institute and our new headquarters. And we're very excited that you're here. And thanks to my co-optimists for joining this panel. Um, uh, I came up with the phrase, the people formerly known as the audience, to um, take notice of a certain social fact, which is that the tools of media production that Dan specialized in and mastered in his career, have now been distributed to the people out there. That is a social fact. People have blogs, they have cameras, they have video, they can edit, they can create their own report and they can upload it and they can distribute it to the world. So the people formerly known as the audience are simply all those people out there with all those tools for doing media. And uh, because we are an open society, a free society, we know that some of those people are going to pick up those tools and try to inform other people. So that's citizen journalism. When people tick, tick, uh, pick up the tools that they have and they use them to inform other people, that's what I call citizen journalism. So uh, that's just a social fact. And it uh, comes about because we happen to live in a time of amazing transition. And this is why it is fortunate if you're a journalism student today. Um, the way I look at this transition is um, 
by focusing on the people that I study, uh, the professional tribe of journalists, which we have representatives of here. I call them a tribe, even though they don't necessarily like that description, um, because I, that's what they are. They are uh, they're a group of people who believe in the public service mission of the press that you just talked about, who work in different companies, different um, media, different platforms, and who get paid for it, and who have developed a profession that we teach about here at NYU uh, that is about 100 years old, the same age as the National Press Club. And the National Press Club, which tries to create a space for this tribe right, in Washington is really part of, of what I call a tribe. And since I study this tribe, I'm very interested in their fortunes and the way I see this situation now is that the tribe of professional journalists is in a situation of forced migration, meaning they can't live anymore on the land that they had colonized and developed so successfully for over a hundred years. The land gave out. And they realized, they realized that right around 2004 when you gave that amazing speech in Hollywood, Tom, to the Online News Association, they realized that they're, if they're gonna have a future for their people, for their tribe, they're gonna have to migrate across the digital divide and rebuild their life on new soil. So that's what I mean by forced migration. Now the thing is, when you get there, the most amazing fact, there's people already there <laughs> developing the web. And they have the powers of the media. They have video. They have text. They have photography. They can distribute their work then they are already developing this new land. And so in any situation of migration, which after all is a human trauma, there are people who are excited and they can't wait to get there to the new land of news. There are people who are afraid. We know them. They work in news organizations, some of them. Right? I call them the curmudgeons and I never tire of criticizing them and ridiculing them. There's people who don't wanna go there are people who are being shed, as you mentioned, with all the layoffs, because the tribe can't afford them anymore. Right. And the space on which this tribe can develop journalism and grow its, itself is just shrinking, and so they have to migrate. And in migrating, when you migrate, you have to ask yourself a series of agonizing questions. What can we take with us? What will, do we know that will be vital on the other side? Right? Uh, how can we reproduce our way of life when the land that it sprang from is gone? Uh, are we strong enough to survive in the new world? And what's essential to our way of life? And so the way I see this now is that all of those questions are being asked right now. And, and people are making the journey over. The AP is making the journey over. The New York Times has has made the journey over. And they're discovering that there is a new land of news and we can thrive there. What's interesting about it for me is that it's a very different land. There are people already there. Uh, territory is free. It's like a frontier. It's like the Wild West. It hasn't been colonized yet. It hasn't been civilized yet. It's still wild in a lot of ways. That's what's fun about it. That's what's cool about it. That's what makes me optimistic. Uh, and let, let's get to, uh, before we get to Manifest Destiny and the, uh, <laughs> let's talk about how this is uh, playing out in this election. Uh, how is the, this election changing? The, how is media changing? The news media changing how they're covering the election? And how are the candidates changing how they're reaching uh, the voters? Uh, with what's going on. Can anybody want to jump in sure. on that there, Judd? I just anecdotally share with you from last night covering the, I was supervising the Times' debate coverage, and, you know, we were, as were other news organizations, you know, we have on our caucus blog, uh, Kit Seely, who was live blogging the debate, and at the same time we had, you know, a video feed of the debate. So it was very 
cool. I didn't even have to uh, have the television on. I could, you know, watch the debate on my computer screen and watch, you know, Kit Seeley's commentary, you know, right, analyzing things as McCain and Obama uh, said them. And that was not happening in my newsroom in 2004. It wasn't. And, you know, this uh, premium on speed, I'm, I'm in awe of, you know, the talent of our, because Kit Seeley is one of the most experienced, you know, she would have been one of your probably, cur maybe a curmudgeon 10 Almost. years ago. Uh, she'd been covering national campaigns, you know, since for the times, you know, going back to, I met her on the Dole campaign in, in 96. And, you know, to, she's just blocked, you know, she has gotten to the new place. She's migrated very successfully and is able to just, you know, write, uh, you know, it's not even on deadline anymore. It's in the instant moment. Uh, absorb, analyze, and and you know write about the debate in a way that you know holds up all of the points she made in real times are ones that you know other reporters made in different ways uh, and, and a little bit more formally in the actual news stories that we had in the paper, full stories on the web this morning in our report, but. You know, it's, it's really something to behold. It's multi-platform coverage with reporters, go, you know, who used to uh, mainly write newspaper stories, now being completely comfortable going out, you know, with cameras, uh, you know, writing a blog post, doing a quick version of a story for the web, and then, you know, going deeper with it uh, for you know, the next day's paper. It's just what's expected now. And I think, you know, there's a lot of excitement, but more than, you know, the woe is us over the business model and, you know, all of that is the, I think the most challenging thing to the journalists I work with now at the Times is just trying to do it all and, you know, fill, uh, the appetite, especially on something like the campaign, on all our platforms, all day and all night long. I think very few of uh, the reporters sleep anymore. I've so, decided yes, uh, sleep is is old. Well, In the, after we migrate, we're not going to have to sleep anymore. That's right. Uh, uh, that, 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 there is a burnout factor here, and uh, Tom and Jay, I think, I have. A, uh, you want to start with Tom, then we'll go right to Jay. Jay go start with Jay and go to Tom. Okay. Um, well, um, during the age of broadcast media, uh, which um, <laughs> operated on a, a one-to-many model, right? One transmitter, many receivers. We had uh, a model of broadcast politics that corresponded to it. So it used to be that to run for president, for example, you um, hired your consultants and you raised your money and you made your ads and you determined what your message was, right? And then you went out and you tried to win the news day right. and you put together your polls and the polls told you what the message should be and, you, and that's how you ran for president. Broadcast media corresponded to broadcast politics. Well, if we look at the situation today, not from the point of view of what's different about all the political journalists of the New York Times, which is one story, and you, Jill just described it very well, but if you think of it from the people formerly known as the audience's point of view, what's different today for them is that they're still connected up to big media, to NBC and CBS and the New York Times, but they are also connected horizontally to one another, uh, and not just connected a little bit, but very easily. They can um, easily uh, connect point to point, um, many to many, few to few, and it's the overlay of vertical broadcast media messaging you with this new horizontal social media that provides the unique flavor of the campaign now. So that if Obama gives a speech on race and the networks think it's pretty important and they cover it, that's broadcast politics. But 
when people share it and download it and give it to each other and generate interest on it on their own on YouTube, and it has more downloads at YouTube than it has viewing from the media, then you can see that we have a different system. And so what's different today is that informing people about the campaign is something done by journalists, by the New York Times, by the AP, but also by friends and neighbors, one another, fellow citizens. You can inform yourself much more easily than you could before. And the same things that are true in the media are true in politics. And so we have today a wave of democratic participation in politics, in media and in campaigns. And that ultimately is what's changing the world. The falling cost for like-minded people to locate each other, share information, collaborate, and make themselves heard is going to be a new era in media as well as politics because it allows people to organize themselves in different ways. Tom, if you have uh, something to add on what's changing. Uh, a couple of things in this campaign are interesting. The Obama campaign had really studied that phenomenon, captured it, I think, better than any of the other candidates Absolutely. Uh, on both sides, uh, and, and really exploited that. And they have done well at micro-targeting and have really come after certain audiences and have then tried to organize them in a way to take them to the next step, or participation or volunteering. It's interesting that uh, Senator McCain's campaign gave the press the most access. And Senator Obama's campaign was not open to the traditional press at all. In fact, the effort was to speak uh, beyond the traditional press. And, and the traditional press did, did not have the access. And Senator McCain exhausted uh, the traditional press, would stay on the bus, answer questions well after all the questions had uh, come up that anybody could possibly think of, and he was still ready to go and the reporters were ready to go to bed. Uh, and, no, 2008, this year. And then of course he had to make the transition because it wasn't getting out there. So those are some of the things that have played out this year. We all have uh, new technical aspects. We actually had uh, a former NBC anchor anchoring some of our election night programs. And a couple things I would point out to you, and uh, the interest in this campaign is worldwide. And we had on Super Tuesday uh, a couple dozen international networks uh, at AP, and we had a half dozen going live into uh, drive time in Europe reporting the results of Super Tuesday. And we have several that have already contracted for election night that will be there and will be going live into drive time in Europe again. So that's one point. And the other point is I f first was part of a presidential campaign in 1964 and then again in 1968. And I can tell you that the depth of information that we now have available is so much better and how we go after the issues is so much richer. There is so much more available to people. There are more checkers on who's saying what and who's doing what, but for the most part, we have far less access uh, than we did way back when. Uh, there's all, so many points here, but Dan, Dan uh, I'm really interested in what you're doing. This uh, HDNet, you, have, it's your, you are getting the backing of a, a very wealthy person who is letting you create something from the ground up. And when I go across the country, I'm hearing that this is what's going to happen, that new organizations, new, new organizations are just going to be built from scratch. And tell us a little bit about how you think that. that well, is I'm good. glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I spoke earlier about the, the need, uh, the imperative, if you will, of those who own and operate and manage our major mass media outlets, uh, what I'm engaged in is something uh, small, a beginning, something that we've built from the ground up, piece by piece. Uh, Mark Cuban, who is an entrepreneur who lives in Dallas and made his fortune in the dot-com bubble, uh, he hasn't said this to me, but I think it's clear that he seeks to be in the mold of William S. Paley, Bill Paley, who built CBS News. He was a great believer in saying, listen, I'm in business to make money. Um, after the company went public, I'm in business to deliver stockholder value, but I see news as a public service. Or the Sulzberger family, which owns the New York Times. Uh, 
they're in it to make money. They have to make money to survive. They have to live a stockholder value and all of that. Uh, but they hold dear the traditional values of quality journalism with integrity. So in answer to your question, I think part of the future will be people such as uh, the Salzburgers, the Mark Cubans of the world, who say, I believe in journalism, quality journalism, as part of the red beating heart of American democracy, and uh, that I want to, to, to help it. Uh, we put on a weekly news program uh, on HDNet, which Mr. Cuban owns completely. It's not a public company. Uh, and he told me when he hired me that he would give me um, complete, total, absolute, creative and editorial control. Uh, this is unique in my experience. I can't say it's unique in history, but it's unique in my experience. And he has been as good as his word. And therefore, uh, because uh, his business model at the moment and for the foreseeable future is not based on ratings, demographics, or for that matter, advertising, uh, that we spend uh, probably a good 35% of our resources on uh, international coverage, which we consider one of our specialties, and probably well, no less than another 40, 45% on hard-edged investigative reporting, what's wrong with electronic voting machines, uh, why do gas cans explode, those kinds of, uh, of issues. But I want to broaden out, I know you want to, uh, the questions we were talking about, you know, the here and now and what it may tell us about where we're going. Uh, it seems undeniable that this 2008 presidential election campaign and the coverage of the campaign will be seen as a, if a kind of tipping point, if you will, a breakover point, uh, not only for American journalism, but I think beyond that. Uh, the, we're witnessing a shift in the balance of power. You may want to argue that it's a slow shift or a medium shift, but certainly a shift in the balance of power towards new media, the kinds of things that uh, Jay Rosen spoke of. And by the way, Jay, if I had known you were gonna speak of the tribes, I would have brought my headdress and my wigwam with me, but I didn't realize we'd be getting into that. They don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, this shift in the balance of power is toward new media, uh, and that has uh, some very important repercussions and will echo uh, through journalism, particularly American journalism, for some time to come. That uh, the present, the 2008 presidential campaign has already earned the nickname, the tag of the, the YouTube election. And I think there's uh, something in that, you know, exemplified by the Obama song, Scarlett Johansson uh, doing something for Obama, that the online impact uh, in the campaign, which has been tremendous and unprecedented, uh, is also uh, influencing journalists in every newsroom, whether it be over the air uh, or print. Uh, it's also influencing uh, opinion makers, opinion leaders, and for that matter, those who sell their opinions. Uh, thanks to a, a swelling army of amateur journalists and those who, who see the new way, maybe haven't figured it out, but see it. And the, this, this whole, the, the center of gravity is shifting. It's shifting to new media, to online. That doesn't mean that we're going to be without newspapers at, at some near point, or we're going to do away with the evening news broadcast. Uh, you know, it is not true that I was covering politics when Sam Houston was still writing, <laughs> but I am old enough to remember uh, when radio began to really take traction. There were people, including people in my own neighborhood, who said that's the end of newspapers. Who's going to read a newspaper when you can turn on and get something electronic with radio? Goodbye newspapers, radio is going to obliterate them. Well, it didn't happen. And then in the immediate post-war period, uh, it began talk being television, radio with pictures. Uh, we could barely imagine such a thing, but it was taken as a given that television uh, would behead both uh, newspapers and probably radio as well. Well, here we are in 2008, and uh, newspapers are alive. One can argue about how well they are. I do think that these pronouncements about their death are premature, but nonetheless, newspapers can still be a good business. Perhaps a shrinking business, perhaps not as good on dollar for value, but a good business. Magazines, uh, same thing. Uh, strange and mysterious things are happening in the magazine business, which I don't profess to understand. But the point here, the idea of when I say that the center of gravity has shifted to new media and to online, it doesn't mean 
that anywhere in the near future we're going to be without newspapers, magazines, radio uh, newscasts, or television newscasts, provided, speaking of television newscasts, that they don't succumb completely to the temptation, to the seduction of becoming viewscast. That so often now what are advertised as, quote, newscasts, or in fact, a views cast, in which you get four or five people in a room to shout at one another and give their views, and that's what passes as news. Uh, Jill, it looked like you had something to add there, but uh, the, the, the question is, how much can the media pie be sliced before it turns to mush? Uh, if, uh, you know, supply and demand, you've got so many, the, the supply of news seems to be growing, to, but uh, are the bloggers making any money? Is, uh, HDNet making any money in uh, time? Before you answer, yeah. let me point out that, and with respect, uh, we shouldn't necessarily buy into the idea that it's who's going to get a slice of the pie, assuming that the pie remains the same size. I think the pie will grow. And as the pie grows, if you follow this analogy, which is not nearly as good as Jay's about the tribes and <laughs> what have you, but that, for example, for a long time in Great Britain, labor organized, uh, said, we want a bigger slice of the pie. Whereas American labor during that time said, we want to help grow the pie. So I just want to make that point. It doesn't mean that the pie remains the same size and we're all fighting over what slice of that pie, that the pie is growing. There are people who go online now. There are people who engage in new media who were not watching or listening to the news before, for that matter, reading newspapers, particularly among young people. Uh, Tom? Let me try to make uh, uh, a couple of points and join the tribe with traditions. Um, but the issue that Jay put on the table uh, is one that once you cross the digital divide to this new promised land, there is not enough fish and game, or in the spirit of this campaign, there is no moose in sight uh, <laughs> to, to have the people, enough people, feed uh, in the manner that they have become accustomed or in many places in a way that would pay for what we do, which is very expensive. Um, and at these panels, we have content people and uh, we try our best to give some answer, but the digital divide is a head fake. This is really about a change in distribution we don't have control over our distribution systems. And the old distribution systems provided lots of money. There was a toll, uh, and the toll could be collected in a number of ways, uh, and that's gone away. So one of the things that's happening, before you get to the people who are across that land living so freely and having the time of, of their new lives with all these new uh, gadgets that are out there, the competitive set has changed. And when we talk in terms of traditional newspapers or traditional networks, there's something else that's come up and they're living pretty well in both camps. Uh, ESPN, CNN, uh, Bloomberg in finance, and then in the entertainment side, you have something called TMZ and some others that are emerging. So there are people that are finding ways to make a lot of money, uh, and they are covering it, and it's more by specific subject than the traditional all-purpose, one-size-fits-all. So that's a big part of what's changing, and it starts with the distribution. And frankly, none of us has figured out how to get the funding uh, in the new distribution system. I appreciate what Jay said earlier, but we don't think we're we're there. We don't think we have sorted out all the issues. Uh, we have had a market share uh, that approximates 98 percent of all media, and that is going to shrink. We know that as the media pop